Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship here at the New Life United Methodist Church. Greetings to all of you, and thank you for coming and being a part of what God has planned for us this day. Some things for us to be aware of is the mission of the month is the shoebox ministry, and this has been uh, our mission for the month has been collecting uh, monies that help with the shipping, but also encouraging you um, to think about either contributing towards the, the items that go in the box or packing a box yourself. And so we have this week and next week um, to continue that. But the boxes won't be finished until the third Sunday of November. Um, but the mission of the month is that. And so this morning we have two short videos for you to watch. When those lids come off those boxes, you've never seen such pure joy. This is amazing. As you can see, the children's faces, they are excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. Can this be packed? It's time for a rapid fire round of Can It Go? Scissors, yes. Razors, no. Lipstick, yes. As long as it isn't liquids such as lip gloss. Tools, yes. However, these are best for children in the 10 to 14 age category. The only tools that can't be included are saws and knives. Candy, no. Chewing gum, no. Toothpaste, no. Stuffed animals, yes. Candles, yes. Matches, no. No types of fire starters are allowed. Mirrors, yes. As long as it's enclosed like a compact mirror. Glass, no. Superheroes, yes. Camouflage items. If the child can wear or use the items without looking like a soldier, they are okay to include in your shoebox gift. Bright or colored camouflage is safe as are pencils, wallets, or socks. Saws and knives or multi-tools with knives? No, no kind of knives except butter knives are allowed. Squirt guns, these can be included as long as they do not look like real guns. Seeds, no. Batteries, yes. But if they are loose, cover both ends with tape. Paint sets or glue bottles, no. Both of these items are liquids and can't be included in your shoebox gifts. However, dry paint sets, such as watercolors or glue sticks, are okay to pack. Remember, always refer to our official inappropriate items list at samaritanspurse.org OCC when sharing whether something can or cannot be packed in a shoebox gift. When sharing what not to pack, stick to the guidelines, not personal preference, and no shoebox shaming. Our official list is no candy, toothpaste, gum, used or damaged items, war-related items, seeds, food, liquids or lotions, medications or vitamins, breakable items or glass, or aerosol cans. To see what to pack instead, check out our gift suggestions by age and gender at samaritanspurse.org OCC. Now, if you all take out a pencil and a piece of paper, we'll have a quiz. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but you know, I have to say something because I'm excited about the shoe boxes. We already have two boxes packed already, guys. We're two ahead right now. We're plus two. So you, you can get a box if you want to. They're up above the, the uh, coat rack in the coat room. So if you want to get a box right now, they're just a plain blue box. So if you want to get a box, you can. Or Missy remind me today, and that's why I'm making the announcement. If you don't want to get out and shop, but you want to do a shoebox, let us know. Missy and I 
Kathy, are you in for shopping? Where's Kathy? <laughs> you in for shopping? Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Anyway, so anyway, that, that, and last day for candy this Sunday? A week from today because of our Halloween party. We've got a lot, but we have a lot of kids, so thank you. Thank you. Well, we kind of expect a big crowd, so, and if you drop something off, be sure it's a wrapped candy, and uh, we'll pass it out. And if you want to come and help, double plus, so thank, thank you. So the well is out there, they had to empty it, but the well is back out there, so if you want to this Sunday or next Sunday, if you want to bring in wrapped candy, you may place it in there. It is for the Halloween party, which is on Halloween evening at six o'clock, is that correct? At six o'clock, and they need help. So any of anybody that wants to help volunteer with some of the games and some of the activities, um, see Missy uh, or Sue, and they will put you on the list. We mailed out pledge cards. It's on a yellow sheet of paper um, for our fall stewardship campaign as the finance team begins to prepare that task of putting together the budget for next year. And we would like the pledge cards turned in next Sunday. We will collect them. We will have a place in the back, a basket to put those in, and we will collect those and have a time of prayer on, during the service for that. If you need one of these yellow sheets out the door on my right to your left, around the corner, there's a stack of these on the table there, and you may look at that. The information is there. If you just cut off the bottom and turn that back in, that would be greatly appreciated. Prayer cards, yellow cards in front of you are for, are for prayer requests uh, for joys as well. And those will be collected during the children's time. Um, so please, if you want to fill it out, and then the usher will come and collect those. Offering plates are in the back of the sanctuary, at the back corners of the pews. We invite you to put your offerings there. And um, if you're watching this as a recorded video, we encourage you to mail your offerings to the church office. Gary is also holding a clipboard that is a continuation of names, addresses, and pertinent information. We are updating some things in the office, um, but also um, moving towards the, the very strong possibility of looking by the first of the year to consider um, looking at uh, another pictorial directory. And, but the first thing we have to do is correct information. If you look up your name in that list, and it is okay, if everything is correct, just put a check through it or put okay beside it or something so that we know. If there's something that isn't correct, cross off what is wrong and write in the correct information. If your name is not on that list, we apologize. And either add that in a blank space at the bottom or flip the page over and add it in the back side. All right? Any other announcements for us this morning? Arvin? Any other things? If not, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, the many blessings that you've given to us in this past week into our individual lives, but as families and as a church and a community. We thank you for things that have happened this year, and Lord, as we approach that time to think about things in the new year, we are grateful for the ways that you continue to move us but continue to strengthen and encourage us and help us to be the hands and feet of Christ. But Lord, we ask your blessing on this time together and upon this service that is before us for all that you have planned. Lord, we thank you for all of the participation and we thank you for all that will come before us. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able to share together in the call to worship this morning. Like the prophets of old, O God, your son was sent to spread the word. And like the prophets of old, Christ Jesus died at the hands of those whom he has, was sent. And like the prophets of old, O God, like the prophets of old, O God, then we will be truly be neighbors to those in need. Would our children like to come forward? Good morning. How are you guys? School go? Good. Yeah. How many days to vacation? I don't know. Huh. We always knew how many days to vacation. Don't you want a vacation? Yeah? Okay. Hmm. Sometimes. 
Well, if you like school and you like your teacher, you'll stay focused on that. This morning, the scripture we're going to read in a little bit it comes from a man by the name of Paul. Do you know who Paul is? Have you heard of Paul before? No. Paul was this man that for a long time, he was kind of one of the bad guys. You know, he, he tortured and he killed Christians because he didn't like them. And one day, something happened to him, and he heard the voice of Jesus, and his life was turned around. And now, instead of doing the bad things, now he travels around, and he, he's starting churches and sharing about Jesus Christ with people. And so he traveled all over, and he had, he had all these different journeys, and he ends up in Rome in prison. Okay. And the story today is about a couple of helpers that came to help take care of him. Because in prisons in those days, they didn't serve you meals and take care of you. And sometimes there were folks on the outside that had to come help you. Well, prior to the scripture we're reading today, Paul wrote this verse. And I wanted to talk with you about these verses. In Philippians 2, verses 14, 15, and 16, it says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, and a warped, warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. There's a lot of things that are going on in there. But did you catch the phrase that says, You will shine among them like stars in the sky? Did you hear that? Now who, when it says, then you will shine among them, who do you think Paul's talking about when he says you? Any ideas? How about you? And you? And you? And you? And all of these people? Do you think we can shine like the stars? Yeah. And Paul says there, there's two things in this passage. And it's not just about what we do in life as we get older, but even you can shine like the stars. There are two things in this passage that I want you to hear this morning, okay? And, and, and one of the things for important for Paul was sharing God's word, telling them about Jesus, telling them about God and his love and his grace and forgiveness, okay? So there are two things. First, he says, as you hold firmly to the word of life, all right? What's the word of life? Do you know what the word of life is? It's Bible. It's what we find in the Bible. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's telling about Jesus and who he was and what he's done for us, okay? So the first thing is for us to, to hear that word, to read that word, to study it, meditate, pray about it, and come to some understanding of how that word helps us in our daily lives, right? All right? And that becomes important. But it also becomes important for us to share that with others. When we hear a story, we hear one of the parables, and, and we, we hear it, and we kind of get some ideas of what that means and how it helps us in our lives, a good thing is for us to share that story. But then there's all kinds of people like Noah, Moses, Jonah, Abraham, all kinds of people that we can share about, can't we? We tell others about them. But there's also another important piece in the very beginning of these three verses that says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Now, what does that say to us? Okay. Yeah. They'll like us, but it also means that we'll get along, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's this thing that goes around on Facebook every once in a while that says, if you really want to have a good life and you want to enjoy life, is make sure you put positive people around you and not negative people. All right? And, and grumbling or arguing, it doesn't get us anywhere, does it? Okay? Because Paul would say to us in another place is that we are to encourage each other, build each other up, and if we're arguing and we're grumbling, we're not doing that, are we? And so Paul's very clear, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Okay? Blameless and pure. All right? That's not finding fault. That's encouraging and building each other up, okay? Children of God without fault and a warped and crooked generation. 
Well, there's a lot of things that happen in our world today and things that aren't always good, right? So we need to do the very best we can to be our best for God, okay? And then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. If we follow Jesus, we listen to what he says, we listen to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we know that God loves us. And as we love each other, as God loves us, Paul says, we can shine like stars. And we can be the people that God has called us, created us, and wants us to be, right? No matter who we are, no matter where we are in life, old, young, tall, short, whatever, we want to be those kind of people, right? So let's give thanks to God this morning. You pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for loving us, for caring for us, and helping us. Help us to be your people by not grumbling and arguing and by holding on to your word. We thank you for Jesus and we thank you for your spirit. But bless me and my family, my church, and my community. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we think about joys and concerns for us, there's some things that we need to be reminded of. A couple of families that have lost loved ones, we think about the family of Brian Botma and the family of Dolores Ingalls. Um, we pray for each of those families for this time, um, for comfort and strength, but for that for which God will provide for them in the coming days and weeks. Also, we have a card, a prayer card asking for prayers um, for Janet Royston's husband, uh, Jean Hashi, I think is the way it's pronounced, uh, has a tumor in both lungs and will have some scans uh, this week to see um, um, what they need to do next. And so we keep um, Jean Hashi in our prayer as well. Let us come before God and let's offer these as well as those joys and concerns that are within our hearts and our minds for those that we are aware of here and for those who are watching this as a recorded video, uh, invite you to name those where you are and lift them to God as well. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your presence amongst us. We know, oh God, that it's not that we have invited you, but it is you who has invited us. For your word tells us that wherever two or three are gathered, you are present. And, and so as we gather today, Lord, you are here. You are amongst us. And your spirit, oh God, your spirit is moving in and out and amongst us, teaching, reminding, doing the very things that Jesus said that the Spirit would come in his absence. And we thank you, O oh God, because you have helped us. You have helped us this past week and even, even in today to um, help us to share the gospel of your son Jesus by sharing the good news and by being the hands and feet of Christ in our world today. Help us, O oh God, not to argue, argue and grumble, but to shine like the stars as we hold dear to the word of life. But we thank you, O oh God, for each and every person. We thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity to lift prayers. And, and we, we pray for these whom we've mentioned as we think about Jean and, and we think about Linda and we think about others, Lord, who have been having some procedures and those who may be sick with the colds and flus of the season. We remember these two families, the Botma family and the Ingalls family, Lord, and in their time of loss, 
Lord, we, we pray that you would just hold them in the palm of your hand. We are thankful, Lord, for the joy of a beautiful weekend, beautiful weather. We thank you for harvest that is taking place, not only in the fields or as the leaves continue to change color, but Lord, in the harvest of your harvest fields. For those who have come to know through words and actions of us as your people who come to know Jesus or to see Jesus in ways that help them, Lord, to think about what life can be like in knowing Jesus. And so, Lord, we just thank you so much for that for which we've shared and that for which is in our hearts and our minds, oh God. And, and we lift those concerns and we lift those joys to you, Lord, for each other, for friends and family. But Lord, we, offer, offer prayer, we also offer prayers for ourselves, for those things that we struggle with, to the strength and the courage that we need to face each day, for those things, oh God, that you would help us to walk through, those things that you would push us and lead us and to pick us up when we stumble. For it is, O oh God, that you are with us and you walk with us each and every day. And so, Lord, we offer all of this before you. And we give thanks and praise to you for each joy, each blessing in our lives that so many times we take for granted. But help us to acknowledge them. And for each of the concerns that we have at this time and throughout this day and in the coming days. So we lift it all before you. We ask your blessing, O oh God. We thank you for listening and hearing our prayers, but prepare us to receive that response. Help us, Lord, that in receiving that response, that we could be a part of the response as those hands and feet of Christ in our world today. So we give it unto you and ask all of this in Jesus' name. But, oh God, we ask that you would hear us as we come together that in one voice, as we share together in the prayer that Jesus teaches us by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. All of them are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy's worth, you know, how like a son with a father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me and trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. Still, I think it is necessary to send you Ephroditus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my needs. For he has, for he has, long, for he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you hear that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have to, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. I am more, I am, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Welcome him then in the Lord with all joy and honor, such, with all joy and honor such people, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for those services that you could not give me.
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you this morning, for this gathering and for this time. We thank you for the word that Ransom brings before us this morning, oh God. Help it not only to resonate in our ears, but oh God, to be written in our hearts and in our minds. And so that we may gain understanding and wisdom, a strength and courage as we hear these words from Paul that helps us to be the hands and feet of Christ in our world today. So bless now the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts. May they be acceptable into thy sight. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me share a story with you this morning. It comes from a man by the name of Stuart Rook. And he is the bishop of the Midwest Diocese for the Anglian Church in North America. He shares this story. He says he was gathered around a, a large bonfire many years ago in the upper peninsula of Michigan. He said he was a part of a larger Christian camp and that he had with him a group of students that he had been pastoring and reaching out to from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And now they were spending this week together in the UP of Michigan. He said to the right from me was, was a Puerto Rican from Humboldt Park in Chicago, a young man who had been a part of a gang but who had just made the decision to become a follower of Jesus. Over there on the other side was a young African-American sister. He said she had quite the day. He says for the first time in her life she saw a live deer and was so afraid that from her city experience that she was hoping to go home that day and I had to talk her out of it. It was something new for her. And then he said there was another young man that was a Latino who would be in just a few moments in telling this story, who would be leading us in a beautiful worship service. And he was pondering all of this. And he said that what a beautiful worship service they had. And after that service was over, he said, I didn't know it in the beginning, but he said we would enter into a massive conflict, all of us who were gathered in that circle. He said the major bonfire argument was fueled by significant cross-cultural differences, immaturities on all of our parts, and the challenge of working in an environment with people that were very new to the faith, people who were still choosing Jesus. He said in the five years of serving at the University of Illinois at Chicago, over and over again he would scratch his head and he would say to himself, how did I get here? How did I find myself here? He says to us, do you ever scratch your head and wonder, how did I get here? He continues in his story to say, when I was asked that question in the days following that bonfire, I could confidently say that the answer to that question, Jesus sent me here. He said, that's how I got here. I was clear on that. I wasn't clear about a lot of things, but I was clear on that. Jesus sent me here. He sent me to sacrifice my energy, my hours, some of the best that I had. He sent me here to sacrifice because it's important in my commitment to Christ. You know, it is important in our commitment to Christ. It is important that we understand that every follower of Christ is what we are called to be about, to share the word of God, to share about Jesus, and to ask those questions. But we have to be clear about how we got there. Jesus has sent you. Jesus has called you. He's asked you to come to a certain place, a job, a family situation, a neighborhood, maybe a situation in your living arrangements or, or a classroom. No matter where it is that he's called you, we have to know that we've been called there by Jesus. Now. We've been talking two weeks ago, we talk today, we talk again next week about sacrifice. And so the key question for us becomes, wherever Jesus has sent us, 
What is it that he has sent us to sacrifice? Where is he sending you, even from this day forward? And how is he preparing you to sacrifice? As it was mentioned earlier, we are preparing for the year of 2023 as, as we, the finance team begins to look at the budget and, and those, those kinds of financial things for next year. And, and so we are in the midst of our fall stewardship campaign. And the question becomes for us is as we think about what our pledge will be for 2023, what is God asking us to sacrifice? For some, that could be easy. I'm willing to sacrifice going through McDonald's once in a while and getting a McDouble and a pumpkin pie. For others, it may mean maybe a more committed sacrifice. But what is God asking us to sacrifice for him so that his kingdom will continue to grow and the ministries of this church continue to reach out even further? You know, what does that sacrifice look like? Where might it lead us in ministry as individuals and as a church as the hands and feet of Christ? You know, we need to understand that to live the way of Jesus is to live the way of him who was sent, Jesus himself. To live as the one who was sent, that is you in your life. Where has Jesus sent you in your life. If we look at Philippians 2 and that first verse that Ransom read for us, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy. You know, when we look at the scripture, we begin to kind of study it, it realizing that, that when you look at scripture, it's like throwing a rock in a pond, and it's where you start where the rock hits the water, because what happens when the rock hits the water? What happens? Ripples, ripples, and they go out from that spot, right? All right, and that's what we have here in Philippians 2. That's our rock. The ripples go out, and we need to understand the larger contextual ripples that are going out in order to understand what's happening within this passage. You see, the first ripple that comes from the rock in reading this word is travel plans. Do you ever think about it that way? Paul says, I want to send Timothy. He's making travel plans. He's making travel plans. And so what we have is travel plans. And Paul's writing this letter to a church that, by the way, he started when he was in Philippi. But the thing about Paul going to Philippi and starting the church in Philippi, we need to understand is he didn't send himself. He just didn't get up some morning and say, you know what, I think I'll go to Philippi today. It didn't happen that way. Because actually, that day that he got up, he thought he was going somewhere else. But then he had a vision. A vision that a man from Macedonia, where Philippi is located, came and said, come over here and help us. Now, so Paul followed that vision. He goes to Philippi, but it was not an easy time. There were a lot of challenges, but yet there were a lot of joys. And so when Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi, this really comes out of one himself who has been sent. And so he knows what it's like to be sent. But we have to deal with these travel plans because he said, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy. And then he brings the gospel into these travel plans because I hope in the Lord, Jesus, to send. When you look at the word send, the word is used four times here. You know, when you're doing your Bible study, and you're looking at a, a passage or a section or paragraph or a chapter of scripture, one of the things you can look for is look for repeated words. Look for repeated words, okay? because it can help us to, to get an idea of how important that may be. And the more it's repeated, the more important and significant that it becomes to the writer of that passage. We know that sin is really important for those who follow Jesus in their life. 
In fact, wasn't it Jesus himself who was always sending people, sending the disciples to do different things? John 20, 21, Jesus, he says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so Paul is living out those words from John in the exact same way because he says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy. The word send here is the exact same word that Jesus used in the Gospel of John. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy, but then later in the passage, I find it necessary to send you Ephroditus because it's important to Paul. To know that Jesus was sent here, to know that Jesus sent out the disciples, that Paul himself was sent out, and he wants to send Timothy and even to send Ephroditus. And so the question becomes extremely significant for us here today is where has God sent you? Where is God sending you? Now some of us can be terrified by that, right? Because, well, where is God sending you? Well, maybe it's to another country. Maybe it's on the other side of the world. No. Well, that doesn't always mean that we're being sent. Now, the first thing we need to really understand about being sent is that it is a gift. You ever think about being sent as a gift? It's a gift in your own life, but it's also a gift to those whom God would send you to. You know, gift and grace are somewhat synonymous in the New Testament. It is a grace to be sent as a gift. You know, you can't or you shouldn't give yourself a gift, right? Right? What do you think about that? You can't and you shouldn't send yourself a gift. Gifts come from where? Not from ourselves. Gifts come from others, right? Because someone has taken the time to show that they care and love you, so they give you a gift. Because love, care, and concern that they have for you. That's the nature of grace. That's the nature of the gift that comes. You know, we don't sacrifice to win with God. We sacrifice to be on the way with God. For he is a sending God. We don't sacrifice to win with God, but if you get there, you can easily slip into what's called works of righteousness. Sometimes we try to earn our place with God. Ever been there? Sometimes we, we really try really hard, but you know what? God knows us. He knows us. He knows you're trying to earn your place with him, but he knows you too well for that. But God does know the sacrifices that we make. And some of the sacrifices that we make are driven by selfishness and hopes that they will be recognized as some sacrifice by somebody else. But, but God knows. You see, he knows how complex the human heart is and how dark it can be. You can never win your way with God through trying to live a sacrificial life that's built on selfishness. But really, it could be a lot better. You see, when we are sent by God, we enter into a way with God. As the Father has sent me, Jesus says, so I send you. You know, we've been sent as a sacrifice to live with Jesus, to be lived, to, li to be with Jesus. That's the commitment we make. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are making a sacrifice in our lives. Remember a couple of weeks ago, in that message of courage to sacrifice, we said to live Christ, to die gain, to die sacrifice, that is gain. It's really what Paul, I think, is thinking about here. That's how we live lives of free sacrifice. Where has Jesus sent you? To live a sacrificial life. Now, all of us 
At some point, as we try to think about what that means, is we have to discern our sending. We may need help from others, other followers of Jesus, others that maybe we gather, like in a Bible study or our Sunday school class or, or maybe some kind of a small group where others will help us to discern what our sending is. Maybe there's a sending coming and we need discernment about where we're being sent and what it is that we're being called to do. But I want to assure you of this though, that wherever God is sending you, it is coming from his heart. It is coming from his heart. And the heart is the character of God. But know that no matter where God sends us, is that he will go with you. Okay? He will equip you. He will provide. And he will do all of that through the church, the Bible, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But he will also give you clarity about being sent. You know, it's really about circumstance. And we just don't live circumstantial lives where we move from one circumstance to another. And we don't live a status quo life. Now, that doesn't say that we don't live lives that are in peace, lives that are satisfying, lives that are without grumbling and arguing, as he says prior to our reading this morning. But we are called as his people to be sent. To be sent. Augustine, an African bishop, says this about a life of sacrifice. The greater one's love is, the easier the work. The greater one's love is, the easier the work. You see, the greater one's love is, the greater your capacity to live in Jesus, the one who has sent you to begin with. And if we become compassionate and allow that to grow within us and stay focused on what Jesus has sent us to do, then the thought is that it becomes easy. What is it? Somebody, I remember somebody on television or something said that if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's what it's saying to us. Perhaps in your lives, as you have grown and developed your relationship with Jesus Christ, and you have listened more to him and, and really strived to follow him in your lives, Maybe your lives have been difficult. The path has been difficult. The sacrifices have some, at some point maybe been overwhelming. And if you're new in your relationship with Jesus Christ, and if you listen and you follow, and you know that he is sending in you and you go, you may encounter some challenges along the point, along the way. But it's going to come. And maybe there's times in your lives that if you're really being obedient and you're going where God is sending you to go and you're making those sacrifices and you just find that it is overwhelming and it's difficult, you may at some point think to yourself, I can't do this anymore. Even though Jesus has called me, I just can't do it. I can't handle this situation. I can't fi find the focus or the determination or the motivation. But it's in those difficult times that our choices, that if we choose to stick with it, it will increase our love through the gift of Jesus. Think about Timothy for a moment. Timothy has probably been sent to Rome he arrives where Paul is in prison. He comes from Philippi. But you know, when he comes to where Paul is in prison, there's a lot happening. We don't know all the details, but there are some things we do know. As I mentioned to the children, that when you were in prison in those times, you were not provided meals. In fact, you were not really given any care of anything, of any way. And you would starve if it weren't for those who would come to help. There was no medical care. Prison was an absolute and utter devastation unless someone was sent to care for you. And that's what Timothy came to do. 
I would imagine Timothy in that moment, he's caring for Paul. He's not out maybe preaching the gospel in the street corners, but maybe he's cooking meals and washing some dishes and tending to Paul's needs. It was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice for Timothy to be here. It was a sacrifice knowing that it would not be easy for him to do. But Paul appreciates what he does, and, and Paul loves him. In fact, he calls him, my son. It was such a relationship that, like a son, he was caring for Paul, perhaps as a spiritual father. He's picking up, he's caring for his spiritual father, all because he's sick and because of the conditions of the prison. It's the assumption we make. But each of us, sometimes, it's a sacrificial sending that we are called to. And sometimes it's life and it's the circumstances. And sometimes it's difficult. But it could be and would be the gospel if you're sent to it. Because that's the gospel work of a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, someone caring for an aging parent. Bishop Rook, who I shared with you in the beginning, tells another story. He says he and his wife would be up early in the mornings. They would get up and they would go out and sit on the front porch for a little bit, about 6.15 in the morning. And he noticed that when they would go out, that they would see one of their neighbors pulling into the driveway at 6.15 in the morning. Bishop Rook says that he would look to his wife and they would kind of back and forth like, where's he been? Is he working a night shift? We just don't know. Bishop Brooks said there was one occasion where he had to leave early because he had a meeting to go to in the morning and so he was leaving early and he noticed at one point when he went to go walking to get into his car, it was that the neighbor was pulling into his driveway about 6.15 in the morning. When Bishop Brooks said he had heard that this neighbor's mother had passed away. And so he kind of hollered across the street that he was sorry about his mother's passing. When Bishop Brooks said that this neighbor never walked across the street, really wasn't all that social. But he walked across the street and he came right up and he stood in front of him. And this neighbor said, yeah, the last couple of years of my mom's life, she hated to sleep by herself in her house. So I would go there every night, sleep in the house with her, come home early in the morning, shower, and then I would leave and go to work. Sacrifice? That's what Timothy was doing. He was called into that. He was serving his father as he looked up to Paul for that father-like figure. You know, sometimes we just need to be, we need to be noble, to be empowered if we're called to such a sacrifice like Timothy. But remember that you are sent, that you are sent. You know, there are people where we are called, but there are also people who are called on our behalf when we can't go to those places where we never go or may not be able to. We have to speak of the Timothy sacrifice that most of us are called to. And we continually ask ourselves, how did we get here? What are we doing? But you know, our answers should be clear. They should be confident to say to people, I'm here because Jesus has sent me. He has sent me to sacrifice my life. So in our own ways, sometimes maybe we don't think so, but if we're obedient and we are responding and we are saying yes to God, then it is that we may be sacrificing like Timothy in our lives. For Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. 
For not only did you send Timothy to care for Paul as he continued his ministry, but you also sent Ephroditus, who was in that passage as well. And it was Ephroditus who came and gave his life, even to almost to the point of death. But he went back. Paul sent him back. Because his sacrifice in life was sharing the gospel to encourage and to build up. And so we are grateful for examples like Timothy and even Ephroditus. Lord, even Paul himself and being sent to places that were difficult and challenging. And yet we think about other stories in the Bible. People who went and weren't sure that that's what they should be doing or they lacked whatever skills or, or whatever kinds of reasons they gave. And Lord, we are no different today. For it is that you call us. And you call us by sending us to go. Sometimes it's just right within our own little circle, our own little corner. And sometimes it's further and maybe even abroad. But oh God, you send us and you send us with a purpose. Help us, oh God, to discern that purpose. Equip us for whatever it is that we need so that in the sacrifice that our life becomes, it is for you and for the building of your kingdom. But, oh God, help us to have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive, as you call us each and every day as the hands and feet of Christ in our world. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Those words of that chorus, my heart shall be my throne, my life I give henceforth to live for Christ alone, for Christ. And back in the second verse, it talks about the sacrifices. It doesn't use that word, but it talks about the trials that we face are our cross. That's a part of the commitment we make when we follow Jesus Christ. So where is God sending you today? What kinds of sacrifices might he ask us to make today for him so that his kingdom will be built and strengthened and that that day we know that is coming when we will reign with him forever and ever. We want to make sure that we are there, but we want to tell others and encourage them. And sometimes we need to be those hands and feet of Christ, going and doing for Christ. My life I give, henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. May God bless you. Go in peace. Amen.